Episode 188 of CBP Cast with guest Peter Bindles, recorded February 27th, 2019. Today's sponsor of CPP Cast is PVS Studio. PVS Studio is a tool for bug detection in the source code of programs written in C, C++, and C Sharp. PVS Studio team will also release a version that supports analysis of programs written in Java. In this episode, we talk about new features voted into C20 at Kona. Peter Bindles joins us after attending the Kona meeting. With Peter, we talk about modules, coroutines, and much more. Welcome to episode 188 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Getting over a little cold, but I'm okay. Getting over a cold. I've been fortunate. I don't think I've really had one this year. No? No. But I mean, I, I got really sick after all of my traveling last year, so maybe that just like did me good for like eight months or something. Yeah. <laughs> Well, here in, in the Raleigh area, we had like a week and a half of rain, so that probably contributed to it. We, <laughs> and everyone who's listening in England right now is oh, like yeah. saying boo-hoo. <laughs> and everyone listening in Seattle, but it, it was abnormal for us here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> At the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got a tweet from Attila saying, uh, CPP cast, you mentioned C++ contracts could interact badly with const expert. Why is that? D has contracts and all D functions are const expert by default, yet this code fails to compile as it should. I think this is something we talked about last week, right, Jason? Yeah, it's something that someone told me at a conference and, you know, I uh, was at CBP con. I haven't gone back and done any research on it yet, but it's like contracts will not be evaluated in a const expert context, I believe was the statement that someone told me. And I don't know if there's still a question about that. Personally, I would say that contracts should be evaluated in a const expert context, and it should fail to compile. It should be a malformed program, just like any kind of undefined behavior or something would be at compile time. But I don't know where that status last left off, and that's specifically what I was alluding to. I see our guest is uh, nodding his head in agreement with you. (laughs) Well, then we'll have to talk about that. Yeah. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, joining us today is Peter Bindles. Peter is a C++ software engineer who prides himself on writing code that is easy to use, easy to work with, and well-readable to anybody familiar with language. Since the last time he's been on CppCast, he presented at multiple conferences about build tooling and simple code. In combining both, he created the build tool Evoke from CPP dependencies and other smaller projects, leading to a simple-to-use build system presented at CppCon 2018. Earlier, earlier this year, he presented its companion 2D graphics library for Absolute called Pixel at CPP on C. He's active in both standards development, as well as helping out with various things at conferences. Peter, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It okay. Like I made a typo. That was meant to be absolute beginners. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes more sense. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> I should send these things out for review before we go live. <laughs> I should read them more before we go live. <laughs> So, That's okay. er, yeah. so the, the 2D graphics library is for absolute beginners called Pixel. Uh, yes. So I've also been talking about the, uh, about with the study group SG20, which is about education, mm-hmm. uh, which basically focuses at given that we have a language called C++, which is according to many horrendously complicated and not suitable for beginners. Mm-hmm. How do we teach it to people who are familiar with a programming language and then carry on from that point? And I've basically given them a challenge, which is, I think we can also teach C++ to absolute beginners, both from the theoretical point of view, as in, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. And from the practical uh, practical point of view, uh, if we want to do this for absolute beginners, what do we actually need? So I've uh, basically boiled that down into three uh, subjects that we need to fix, and most of those are usable for developers and experienced people as well. 
So to start with, I need to be able to build my software, and I need to do that without hugely complicated build scripting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's see how simple we can get things. I've talked to you last time about CPP dependencies, which looks at your code and just knows how to build it. Right. And CPP dependencies allows you to export that to CMake. And then I got to thinking, what happens if I just use this for all my CMake files? As in, I don't write a single one by hand, I just generate everything. Does that actually work? So I tried it on a few simple projects, and it actually works. The only thing I'm doing by hand is renaming files. So I said, well, let's try this on a more complicated project. And as far as I can tell so far, that still works. So I figured, why, why don't I just include that into CPP dependencies? So instead of having it as a, a build and to uh, code introspection tool, use it as a build tool. So okay. of course, that's a giant paradigm shift. So let's take the entire code base, move it over there, optimize it for that use case, and make it do the entire build background as well. And so far, that's worked, and that's ended up ended me up in a talk at CPPCon. Okay, sounds and good. Then, yeah. then you get into the question, given that I can now build code, and as an absolute beginner, I can put Hello World in a folder and just type evoke and everything comes out, including runnable executables, what's next? And then I uh, tried to put the question on Twitter, which is, uh, what would need to change about C++ to make it suitable for absolute beginners? And a, a number of people, at least five or so, replied that's, we need something that's better than 2D or better than console output. So we need, say, 2D graphics or something that allows you to get uh, quick feedback, uh, visual feedback. I.e., we need some simple graphics that allows a beginner to to start out and understand what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And that's basically an idea uh, I developed it together with uh, Jayesh Badwijk. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. And that's uh, become Pixel. So again, a talk at uh, CPP on C. And that one is targeted at the absolute, absolute beginner, which means that the first example that you get starts out with people who don't understand a, a for loop, a while loop, or an if statement. Oh, okay. And you can still do something useful with it that's uh, easy and quick graphical feedback. We can go over then this more later, but I'm kind of curious, um, how does Pixel compare to some of the other well-known uh, C++ graphics libraries like uh, SFML? That's uh, a really good question and one that I got during the talk as well. Okay. So the big difference is, if you look at many libraries, there's uh, SDL, uh, GLFW, they basically provide you the middle layer abstraction that allows you to use OpenGL and other frameworks, but they don't apply the low level, uh, they don't give you the simple interface to use it. SFML, the one that you mentioned, does do that, but it also uh, mostly hides behind, uh, uh, it hides the 2D interface behind uh, its own interface, which means that if you would like to progress from that point on to, say, OpenGL or 3D graphics, you are essentially starting from zero again using SFML mm -hmm. as a windowing library. And Pixel is set up based on SDL, as in I'm not trying to do the, the entire thing from uh, from scratch again, but it starts from what it can do and then gives you 2D graphics built on it in such a way that you can easily extend it to 3D graphics and so on and keep using parts of it that, uh, that you already are familiar with. Okay. Uh, well, let's uh, go to the news real quick, uh, talk about a couple of these articles, and then we'll start talking... Uh, more about your experience at Kona and, and also definitely uh, talk more about Evoke and uh, Pixel, okay? Yeah, sure. Well, they say real quick, Rob, but <clears throat> some of the things in here, this might be a very long news segment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess the, the first thing I, I put in here was the uh, Reddit trip report put together put together by Bryce Lelbeck. Um, I'm not sure if we necessarily need to go through everything here now, but maybe keep this in mind as we uh, you know start talking to Peter about his experience at Kona. Okay. I mean, is there anything we should call out first? We have to call out modules, and we have to yeah. call out coroutines. And both of those are a very special thing that happened at Kona, which is most of the reason I wanted to be there. Yeah. If you've been uh, following the standardization, you know that modules have been somewhat contended over the past few meetings, yes. the uh, C++ committee meetings. And there has been a lot of feedback on whether or not it's actually usable, whether it's buildable, and how the interface for using modules from a compiler and build system should even look like. And as far as we know, and we had a lot of discussions at uh, Kona about how to actually use it, the design as specified in the TS is fine, but the, the compiler interfaces may need more work beyond this stage. Okay. As in there's a GCC style interface, there's a Clang style interface, which is not quite the same. There's a Visual Studio interface that is again very different. And the combination of all three show that every bit of functionality that we need to implement it well in the build system exists and is allowed within the TS. But they all show that there are different ways of doing things, and all of them have different advantages and disadvantages. For us, the, the main discussion was, given what we can see that the TS allows and requires, 
is it possible within the TS to make any kind of uh, improvement that we must require before it can be shipped? Okay. And that was essentially the point behind the paper that I co-wrote, which is uh, P1427. And the idea of that is, if there is anything that requires to be fixed before we can ship modules and have them usable, then we have to do it now, because otherwise we'd be too late. Well, yes, and right. after a lot of discussion on uh, many days, we came to the conclusion that everything currently in a modules TS is as it should be. And there's nothing in the tooling environment that we cannot do. But there may be some guidelines that we need to set out to tell people this is how you should do it, because otherwise you're giving us a really hard time. Hmm. But we also got to the discussion that actually that's not something we could put into the international standard, because it says it's about C++, the programming language, and not how does your compiler look. Okay. So from the from the tooling point of view, we need to have something that we can basically output that says this is how you should be implementing this, and if you do this, then it's much easier. Basically, some uh, guidance advice. You could try to put it in non-normative notes in the international standard, but it's basically putting things in the wrong place. And for that, we decided that we should start working on a TR, a technical report about the C++ ecosystem. So that's including build tools, that's including code checkers, and to make sure that those things can actually read and use modules and then interact with compilers, how they interact with each other, the works. Okay. So we took the set of papers that we wanted to target at the IS, uh, and we basically are retargeting them towards the TR so that we can make a, a TR that represents this is how you use modules, this is how you should set up your code so that the tools can use them. Now, I don't think we've ever really discussed the TRs here, have we, Rob? I don't think we have, no. No, can you give us, like, I mean, now, we, okay, let's just go ahead and admit that the news and interview portions of today's they're, they're episode be will be intertwined. It's fine. <laughs> yes. So, can you tell us what exactly a TR is? Uh, in this case, it's no surprise that you haven't seen it before, because the only time before we had a TR was when we had a TR of a different kind than this one. And that was but the for... standard library updates, right? Yes. Okay. So this was way back in 2005, I believe. We had a TR called TR1, mm -hmm. for lack of a better name, which was <laughs> the stuff that is beyond C++03 uh, put into a report of some kind. And as I understand it, that is TR type 1, as it was called in 2005. Okay. Uh, there was, after that point, the TR type 2, mm -hmm. or uh, TR number 2 of type 1, which was the second <laughs> of version of the library additions. And at that point, they got okay. into C++11. Uh at that point, they also changed the naming of things. So the TR type 1 is now called a TS, a technical specification. Ah, okay. And we're getting into the direction that TSs are actually sort of subject-focused and should be subject-focused instead of completely broad. So the TR1 uh, shouldn't have been like that, but it sort of worked. We now have library fundamentals, uh, TS1, TS2, and TS3, which is sort of broad for what it's actually doing. And we're seeing that the more focused ones, like coroutines, modules, they are uh, working a lot better. So most of the things that we're trying to do in the standard are going to be done in TSs. Right. Okay. And that's technical specification, right? Yes. Okay. So this is what we've had in the past and what we are having now. But as I said, there is TR type 1 in the past, and there's two more TR types. And one of those is basically an uh, advice-giving specification that is non-normative, as in you're not breaking any standard by not implementing it, but it is a strong recommendation. The people uh, wag their fingers at you if you don't do this. Exactly. We'll, we'll tut, tut at you. Uh, very very frowny if you do, don't do this. <laughs> okay. But there's no official power behind us saying you are not implementing the standard as we specified it. And that is the kind of technical report that we're making in this case. So okay. wh what is the progress on this technical report as of the Kona meeting? Like, is it already being written uh, the progress as of the Kona meeting is that we told uh, the Evolution Working Group that we are planning to make one. Okay. And that they said, yes, this sounds like a good idea. Okay. And that is about as far as we got. We realized that we had a few papers that should now be targeted towards the TR, and they are not yet. So those will be in the Kona post-meeting uh, mailing with the updates to be targeting TR. And beyond that, I don't think we, we got much further than that. So to sum up, if I may... The modules TS was accepted. You all said, yes, this is technically correct for what we can put in the standard, but people really need to have some guidelines. The modules TS, as is, is correct as far as everything that needs to go in the standard. Okay. Which means that there's no reason for us to hold it back because there's nothing we are going to be changing. How long did it take to actually discuss that? 
Uh, I think we started on Tuesday, no, Monday evening, and we concluded this on Thursday evening. And you didn't go to bed, probably. <laughs> uh, we, we went to bed at some point, but we had evening discussions lasting until midnight most of the days. So that was your primary focus while you were at the, conf- at the uh, meeting? That was my primary focus to be there. The secondary focus was to listen in on what happens to coroutines, in part because of what happened in the past meetings, and in part because I really would like to use them. So I, I sort of have a, a stake at being able to use them in, in the next standard. So maybe we should talk about coroutines for a bit. Coroutines are the, the second major feature that got accepted out of Kona. Um, and I think we, we've talked a little bit about how, you know, there was Gore's original proposal and then there were a couple other proposals about changes people would like to see with coroutines. What's the final product of coroutines look like? Well, uh, I'd like to first uh, emphasize a little bit on something that I've heard a lot of people say, which is that they are very surprised that coroutines went in. Okay. Okay. Because the discussion in the past was that at Rapperswil, which was in June last year, we had a coroutines proposal. It was sent for a vote on plenary, which is basically evolution says this is good. And then a plenary was voted down. It went mm. to San Diego. It was, uh, was accepted in evolution, went to plenary again, was voted down again. Then we get to Kona. And we get basically the same proposal going to Evolution. Evolution says this is fine. It goes to plenary. Okay. And at this point, there are two things that can happen. And both of them sound like somebody's going to be disappointed, which is either you accept it now, which means that you could have accepted it like eight months ago. And people are <laughs> going to be like, why are you slowing down the standard? You should have accepted it back then. Right. Or alternatively, you decide that we're vo- uh, voting no again, in which case everybody says you're holding up the standard. You could have... It's going to take another three years before this gets into the standard. It's going to slow down everything. Right. So there's basically no way to win. <sighs> but from a practical point of view, I understand the way the vote went. Because the last time at Rapperswil, it was a vote that says, if we're not doing it now, there's no competing proposals, there's discussions between people. And the best thing that can happen is that in four months, we'll have more information, and we can then vote on including it or not. San Diego, essentially the same thing, except there was a third proposal being added by the Bulgarian national body. And this time at Kona, it's basically we have the three proposals next to each other. We see what they mean. We know what they do. Mm-hmm. Everybody's talked to each other. All the information's on the table. And if we decide to vote no, it's going to be no for C++20 entirely. Okay. Okay. So in this case, there's actually an impetus to, to get it into the uh, standard if we are trustworthy that this is a good proposal. And theoretically, everyone says we are fully informed now because we have three proposals and we can weigh them equally against each other. Yes, and to put it slightly in the words of Herb Sutter, if you were not informed at this point, then you should have read the proposals as they were in the mailing. <laughs> right. Right. I.e., it's your own responsibility to keep up with it. And so, the conclusion was that we have Coroutines TS. It has a few tweaks that came in from core Coroutines, which is good. Okay. We had a big discussion that took a full morning about sy- uh, symmetric Coroutines, which is a Bulgarian national body proposal. And there were many uh, concerns from different sides, from compiler implementers, from front-end implementers, about the implementability of it. And in the end, there was decided that the Coroutine CS uh, was going to go to a plenary vote, essentially unmodified. Okay. And in this case, it got accepted because otherwise it would have been three more years and we don't see a major benefit to doing so. So you said that there were a couple changes made based on the core Coroutine's proposal, though? Uh, Yes, but I'm going to have to let you uh, find those yourself because I forgot to look up the exact details. There are very tiny changes as far as I can tell, as in you can still take a look at the entire Coroutine's proposal, and it is mostly correct. Okay. And well, see, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, now that they haven't voted in, but you know, C++20 isn't completely final yet, are we expecting that they might still make additional tweaks to Coroutine's based on some of these other proposals? Uh, given that it's not officially an international standard, everything is still up for tweaks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the guarantee that you get is that we are now beyond Kona, which means the last meeting for getting big features in was Kona, and right. anything new will go into tw- uh, 23. There is no option anymore for putting in any new features. Right. If there's anything wrong with the current features, or if we find big problems, then we might tweak them. We'll probably tweak them. And if something really terrible comes out now, like uh, this is actually unimplementable in uh, some set of compilers, then it, it might still get taken out of the working draft, but that's very unlikely. So but to far, be fair, exactly one time. It already has test implementations in both Clang and yeah. Visual Studio, right? Uh, that's not even entirely accurate. It has implementations in four different compilers. Well, okay. So at least those two, anyhow. <laughs> it has an implementation in Visual Studio for the past five years, in Clang yeah. for four years, 
and Edison Design Group has a front end that also works with it, and okay. GCC is implementing it. So it's probably will not come out with anything major saying this is fundamentally flawed. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, coroutines are like an ancient concept as far as computer science goes. Like the earliest revisions of the art of computer programming have descriptions of how coroutines work. So it seems like something that should be doable, but I keep seeing all these like conversations about stackless or heapless or like how the states manage that kind of thing. Do you know what we actually ended up with? Uh, we ended up with stackless coroutines, and they are usually heap allocating. Okay, usually uh, so heap allocating. Yes, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> um, so the idea behind uh, coroutines is that instead of having a function that executes, terminates, and returns a single value, you can have a function that executes and sort of keeps living. So the next time you invoke it, it will continue from that point on and can, can give you a second, a third, and a fourth value. And it can also be uh, called a second time from a different uh, location. Which okay. means that the calling and returning sequence that you expect in C++ to be very simple is now a lot more complicated in the presence of coroutines. So there's two models that are basically the, the idea behind coroutines. You have the stackful ones, which are, I call a function, it returns, yet stays alive, and its location is on my own stack. Okay. Which means that if you want to call anything else, you'll have to keep in mind that there's a bit of coroutine on your stack, and you cannot return all the way and have the coroutine still exist because something else will override it. Okay. So that's one pro uh, one method of doing coroutines. The alternative is that instead of putting it on your stack, you give it some bit of memory that is then its stack. Okay. And given that you tell the compiler just magically invent the stack for it and go figure out how big it needs to be, it can make it fairly efficiently. That's one of the big discussions that we still had at Kona. And it will allocate a piece of memory for it and put its stack over there. And then if you have a second coroutine, it will have a different stack altogether. So those are stackless because they're not on your stack. They're on your stack, but the memory still has to come from somewhere. Exactly, which is why they are mostly allocating. Okay. okay. In the case that your compiler can, for example, prove that it's not outliving your function, then it can just take whatever space it needs, allocate it on your stack anyway, and use it there. This sounds hypothetically like Clang's heap elision rules, which I hear people say, like, well, yeah, but do those actually come up in real code? Maybe yes. they're more likely to come up in real code. Yes, and that's pretty much exactly the same thing you get here which is one of the points of uh, discussion still, is that if you have something that cannot allocate, i.e. embedded targets, mm -hmm. then this might not be good enough that it's usually non-allocating. Because right. if you tune your optimizer just a little bit differently, maybe it now doesn't know how to do that, and your code fails to compile. Or maybe you upgrade to a newer version of the compiler, and it has different optimizer settings, so the stuff that used to compile now just doesn't compile. Like if it happens to generate a call to new, or if it happens to be able to see through that and not then whether or not your standard library can link basically is what you're getting down to. Yes. So that might be slightly problematic, and that's still one of the points of discussion, how we can make this slightly better so that it's always non-allocating. There was right. one example that was called out by Timur, who was working on Stud Audio, which was discussed but not voted in. Uh, it's going to be a 23-something. Uh, and the idea there is that you have a real-time application that can allocate memory until it enters the real-time part which is, uh, for example, if you have a digital audio workstation used for by DJs, I'm fine with having a whole bunch of allocations and dynamic behavior as soon as the thing is starting up and loading my songs. Right. But the moment I'm actually running a show, I do not want any dynamic allocations, and I really don't want the thing to crash. Mm -hmm. And for that one, the, uh, he demoed that if you allocate all the coroutines up front, it cannot do any runtime allocations while you're just using your coroutines. So while they are still allocating, you do get the benefits of having no allocations at runtime, so they are usable in audio code. Right. As an example. But it's can't the compiler can't necessarily prove every single possible allocation that's necessary for the execution of the it, program. It cannot generically prove that you will never be allocating your program. Right. But your linker can by just not having an operator new. Right. So that if you do at any point actually potentially allocate, it will just not link. Right. Okay. So all of this about allocation and coroutines like raises one obvious question from my perspective is what's the context for a coroutine story? <laughs> that is a really good question and I have no answers whatsoever. Uh, you context might have to make for... a complete talk about making a coroutines cons expert. <laughs> you know, cons expert all the things part 2. Yeah, well, yeah. We'll have to think about that. <laughs> That's going to be a big discussion. That's a good talk idea. Constexper, even more of the rest of the things. Yeah. Yes. 
I wanted to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. PVS Studio Analyzer detects a wide range of bugs. This is possible thanks to the combination of various techniques such as data flow analysis, symbolic execution, method annotations, and pattern-based matching analysis. PVS Studio team invites listeners to get acquainted with the article Technologies Used in the PVS Studio Code Analyzer for Finding Bugs and Potential Vulnerabilities, a link to which will be given in the podcast description. The article describes the analyzer's internal design principles and reveals the magic that allows detecting some types of bugs. Well, should we go over some of the other uh, features that were voted in to Civilization 20 then? Yeah, let's just keep going. Yeah. Like the next one is slightly disappointing to me. So this is uh, static, thread local, and lambda capture for structured bindings? Yeah, that's cool. But it still doesn't allow constex for structured bindings use. <laughs> you cannot do structured bindings in constex per? No, you can't. It's like the reference nature of how they have to be implemented causes problems. Oh, right. Yeah, yes. Right. Yes. Oh, right. Exactly. Anyone yeah, who's familiar surprising. with it goes, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> There's been a couple of functions I've had to rewrite where I was using structured binding, but nope, not at compile time. Yep, we did get a lot more context for this time. Yes. So we so have it's... context for allocation in some scenarios. We have context for vector. Uh, we are potentially getting, I thought that I saw it on the list of things to be discussed, but I don't see it on the list of things that were voted in, uh, a context for other allocators or other containers. So those are in the pipeline, but they're apparently not in yet. Wait, it's so context per vector, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. I was just going to say, there's this second list um, of features that have been approved for C++20 at this meeting or prior, but have not yet been added to C++20 because they're still completing the specification. So is the expectation that everything on this second list will make it in? It says hopefully you know, it will Peter? be added. Ah, yes. Yeah, so in this case, um, the in- exact details on how the standard works is that we try to get things through evolution and library evolution. Right. which means that the design is essentially finished and agreed upon. And beyond that point, somebody needs to actually write the words that go into the standard library or standard uh, specification, which happens in the library and core working groups. The first two have had their deadline basically a hard exit at the end of Kona, and there were many things that were voted in for which there's no words yet. <laughs> then the next hard deadline is for library and uh, core working group to finish their part of the specification, which is checking all words, making sure everything has the exact right meaning, Uh, making sure that no comments have been accidentally italicized that shouldn't have been. And they have a hard deadline at the end of Cologne, which is in July. Okay. So basically this means that all of these things were voted in by evolution and by library evolution, but they are being processed by core and library as far as they uh, they can manage. And anything that is at the bottom of the list that is not finished by July will just not make it. Okay. So there is a priority in that. That is a priority you can influence if you are in one of the proposals. Uh, but that there is basically just a finite amount of time for them to do things. So there will be some things that are essentially okayed, but not yet in the specification, so they will not be in 20 technically. So are you aware, like, if someone just wanted to get involved in the standard, is there room for extra set of eyeballs that can, you know, help review some of these papers and try to help get... F- C20 finalized. Not, I mean, I know the exciting thing to do is to write new papers, right? But... Mm-hmm. There's clearly a lot of work here, right? Yes. So there's a lot of work in core and library, and most of it ha- happens to end up basically at this point in the standardization cycle. Everybody's finished writing their proposals for 20 because there's a hard deadline, and at this point they've basically got a whole bulk of work pending on just them. And just okay. after Cologne, they'll have a, a basic lull where nothing can happen because you are not adding anything to the current standard, and beyond that point, nobody's pushing yet because we have three years. Right. Uh, so you can definitely help them out. They are okay. uh, usually open for uh, for additional help, but keep in mind that the level at which they are discussing things is very high. I've been in the core working group uh, for about two hours at some point in Rappersville, and it took me a lot of time to even follow what they're talking about. <laughs> so if one of these proposals looks particularly interesting to you, or not proposals, but things that have been approved but not yet merged into the standard, you might click on it, look for the author that's currently working on it, set of authors most likely, uh, message them and say, I'm willing to help if you need some help, but don't be surprised if it's over your head because it's it's just that high up. 
Yeah. So the thing you can always do is offer them help with doing the wording. That is something that most library authors don't have a lot of experience with, and it needs to be essentially technically correct. Okay. It needs to be exact in what you're trying to say. So if you have any experience in reading standard ease, then this might be something you can help them out with a lot. And if you are or have been in work, uh, core working group and know what kind of things they typically do, please do help them out uh, because that's the stuff that takes a lot of time from core, basically telling you this is not how we do it because we did it differently in all of these locations. Right. So, yes, okay. you can definitely help out the authors there, and you are helping out core working group and library working group by doing that. Okay. Well, maybe we should go back to the, the list of things that have been voted into the draft. Um, stood polymorphic allocator? I thought polymorphic allocator was already a thing. That one's, I don't know what that's about. Wasn't that I PMR? I also need to read the paper. Okay. <laughs> as far as I know, it's basically PMR. As a vocabulary Passive. type. Ah. So this is taking the PMR memory resource and wrapping it in an allocator so you can use it in any allocator type location. Okay. Now it should make them easier to use then, right? Yeah. Of course, there's standard LERP, which everyone is obviously would know what that does. That was... well, of course, you haven't lerped anything. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so well, I, I actually have no idea what the genesis for the name lerp is. I can look at this and see what I know what it is. It helps you find linear interpolation between values and midpoint ranges and stuff. And okay, fine. What the heck is a lerp though? Why why lerp? It's lerp because that's the short name for linear interpolation. Uh, and also okay. in uh, mathematics, in especially 3D graphics, there's a few related terms like slurp, which is a spherical linear interpolation. Okay. Basically taking, uh, in this case, it's two vectors, and you linearly interpolate between them. And in case of a spherical one, that's like taking two points on a sphere and then doing a linear interpolation along the surface of the sphere instead of through the sphere. This sounds like something you have personally had to do when your experience with routing and GPS software and such. Uh, this is not something that we have in that context, but in context of graphics, this is what you do when you're uh, basically moving something from one point to another. Okay. So in graphics and animation, this is a very, very common function to use, and it's had a whole lot of precedence in using GLSL, HLSL, and so on. And all of those languages call it LERP. So if you, if you look at the discussion notes on what happened to the proposal, there was a uh, suggestion to change the name to something like Linear Interpolate which was voted down because of a strong history of use of the actual term LERP to do this. Wow. Okay. So they've gone with what everyone has agreed is the common name for this thing. Yep. And most of the people that are trying to use this are trying to do the thing that LERP does on my GPU, which now is standard LERP. But it will be okay. confusing to some people who are not familiar with what it does. Well, and also, I think it's worth pointing out that this is not just for numbers, it's for pointers, which... I think then is handy for the kind of thing like uh, implementing quicksort, basically. Binary I did search not algorithms. get noticed this was usable for that. That's a new, th a new thing for me. Yeah, it's a, oh, a, yeah. I th well, or, yeah uh, for binary searching, anyhow, I guess would be. Yeah, oh yeah, it says Java's binary search implementation uses this. Okay, yes, so that's the idea. It's to help eliminate a category of bugs from that all binary search. All binary searches are broken article from forever ago, from 2006, yes. Well, right. that makes a lot of sense, but then again, if you're trying to do binary search, there is a function called std binary search, which might just be exactly what you need. Well, yes, that's that's true, but perhaps, I mean, you know, for some other use case or something. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, actually, if you look at the paper, there is a, a, a point called naming. That doesn't, that's not talking about uh, LERP, actually. It's talking about midpoint. Okay. Yes. So okay. there's one other thing in the currently uh, actually added features, which is std s size. Okay. which is a thing that's been mm. a subject of a lot of discussion. So I'm not sure if all the listeners have been following along, but there's a big discussion about East Cons versus West Cons. <laughs> well, yes, of course. Where many people have wristbands that say East Cons or West Cons, and some have both. Yeah, why not? Which is both? about one of the biggest discussions that, uh, that currently exists, where people are still not agreeing. The second big, big, big discussion is about whether or not you should be using signed or unsigned for sizes. Right. Mm-hmm. And so far, that discussion has gone in the direction of we've been using uh, size T, which is unsigned as a size. So we should be using that for size in all the other containers as well, including the ones that we're adding. Which went fine until somebody managed to sneak in a signed size on span. Yes. Okay. Which then got into a huge discussion saying, well, we have a, size, uh, a signed size now. Maybe we should change everything else to match. Maybe 
And after a whole lot of discussion, they basically got to the conclusion that they are changing it to a unsigned size, and everything gets an S size function, which is a signed size. But so we're adding S size function to every container. S- as far as I've understand, understood, this is basically to everything. Okay, now I want. All right, I, I I want someone to convince me that I'm wrong, so I will give my my spiel for just a moment here. Uh, but I think this is an absolutely terrible idea, and it is because today, with let's say uh, standard deck, which the way it does allocations of blocks can easily have many billions of items in it on a modern computer. If it has 3 billion items in it, because we have designed it such that that is allowed, and we now call this S-size function, what do we get? And for our listeners who aren't following along for whatever reason, that's greater than 2 to the 30... It's greater than the maxed signed 32-bit or uh, 32-bit integer, yes. So this would be on 32-bit platforms that this would be a problem. So the theoretical objection is that if we ever exceed the allowable amount for a signed size, that it would be undefined behavior. But in Mm. a practical note, it's pretty much impossible on any platform to do that. Ah, well, okay. So I guess you're saying on a 32-bit platform with 32-bit sizes, it's highly unlikely that you would ever exceed 2 billion items in a container. And on a 64-bit platform with 64-bit sizes, it's unlikely you would ever exceed whatever that giant number is. Yes. So if you're on a 32-bit platform, for ease of numbers, because they're much smaller, uh, you would need to have something that is bigger than 2 gigabytes when the total addressable space by both you and the kernel together for anything at all is 4 gigabytes. And you need to have more than 2 gigabytes of contiguous memory. Well, it doesn't have to be contiguous with something like with something like DEC or LIST. Yes, but if you're doing that, then you have even more part of that as overhead in making it non-contiguous. Okay. I may accept your answer that this is not terrible. This is not a thing that you're practically going to be able to do. And right. If you're wondering about the size of that in uh, 64-bit, I think the name would be uh, 9 exabytes. Right. Which is, to put it into terms that are slightly more understandable, 9 million terabytes. As in, take the biggest commercial hard disk you can find right now and have like a million of them. <laughs> and have that as your contents of your storage. I have that and in my basement. And then exceed it. Because you need to exceed it before you get to the point where this breaks. And that compares to the amount of advantage that you get when you uh, subtract something from the size and you just see if if it's negative, then it must have been empty. I can see a strong point for standard size, for assigned size. Right. Yeah, okay, I will I will concede that it's not as terrible of an idea as I, I thought it was. That said, I am on the, size, uh, on the side that is an unsigned size is the only thing that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but I can see arguments how did it get sides. into span in the first place? Was it just a mistake? Did someone just overlook that? It was not a, a mistake. Size? No? Uh, I don't know the exact details. Jason, do you know okay. this? I don't know the exact details, but I am almost 100% certain that it was intentional because it was from someone who is on the camp of these things should be signed. Oh, okay. There are a lot of discussions about these kinds of details. And in some cases, they actually have a bit of merit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, all right. I, I conceded my my fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything else we want to go over that we haven't touched on already? Uh, I, I mean, like they're basically all all simple minor things. Yeah, I like the flat map and flat set that have been approved, but still need wording. If you're looking at that list, then definitely those are nice. But I'm more I, looking forward to context per vector and context per string than flat map. Uh, yes, but I, I, well, I've written flat map a couple of times because for very tiny maps that you need to create quickly, it's, and you don't care about lookup time as much, uh, or if lookup time is very small because a linear search through three elements is faster than a binary search, then yeah, um, I'm cool with flat map. I've also at some point looked at a a benchmark look, uh, looking at flat map compared to a standard map and an unordered map. Yes. Which basically shows that up to about 100 elements, using a flat map is faster. I easily believe that, yeah. On From current hardware. On, unordered map is faster, and at no point is a standard map actually the fastest. Right. That was, to me, the biggest surprise, as in, up to now we used uh, map, and now we get unordered map, and now we get flat map, which basically means that for the purpose of lookup, map stopped, using, stopped having a function. Yeah. Because at no point is it the best option. That's interesting. And the rationale behind flat map being faster is because it's uh, very much more compact. It's uh, co-located. 
So any lookups are just running through your cache. So if you have small objects, there's like 16 of them per cache line. So searching for something is really quick. Yeah, and that was my use case is I needed maps that were literally like five elements at most. Yep. So even if you have slightly bigger objects, if you just put three to five things in there, that's still going to be very fast compared to having a regular map, which starts to build a red-black tree up to three or four levels deep, which means you get four pointer chases <laughs> and cache invalidations and so on, which makes it a lot slower. Right. So just using an order map would have been already an improvement there. But an order map specifies that as far as I remember, all the elements have to be allocated outside of the actual map. So you have the map as a hash uh, index, and then there are uh, chains beneath that of the actual elements. Yeah, both all of the containers, well, th now that they have the move, what is it, move node member functions, so it's take node and move, something like that, where you can like literally steal elements out of a map and put it into another one, so they have to be heap allocated separately outside of it. I think as far as I know that they did that already. Yeah, yes. If only because trying not to do that is very complicated and very likely to lead to two tiny bugs that are going to crash applications in corner cases. Right. So, Peter, how many um, times have you managed to make it to a standards meeting? Was this one of your first ones? This is not the first one. I've been to Rapperswil as well. And okay. I uh, wanted to go to San Diego, but it's a far away uh, place for me, so I wasn't able to go there. Uh, Wait a minute. The is video... Kona actually closer than San Diego? Uh, Kona is surprisingly very far away from everybody. Well, yeah, I didn't, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> now, Kona was, I think, a 26-hour flight in total, including wow. changeover at Seattle. Okay. So, and it's an 11-hour time difference, so it's perfectly opposite of at home. But it's the one meeting where we get to get, uh, have the final discussion about contracts, concepts, ranges, uh, modules, right. coroutines. It is the most important one in these three years. Okay. So as much as I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to try to help out everybody who's going to Cologne because there's really important work to be done for wording, I uh, sadly will not be able to go because it conflicts with something else I have to be at. Yeah, and Cologne is practically down the street from you. Well, Cologne is an hour's drive. I could just go there every day. Right. I don't recommend doing that at a standards <laughs> meeting because you are basically <laughs> stay doing very, very complicated C++ for 16 hours a day. And given that you're doing very complicated stuff for 16 hours a day and need like eight hours of sleep a day, you are busy 24-7, so you don't have time to drive an hour back and an hour forth. <laughs> Plus, you'll fall asleep while driving. <laughs> yes, I don't recommend that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a bad one. <laughs> it, it sounds exaggerated, but the time I was at Rapperswil, I was there for five days, tried to leave on Friday evening to drive home, and had to pull over on a rest stop uh, in Germany somewhere because I was just almost falling asleep while driving. That is a considerably further drive than Cologne for you. That is true. That was about nine hours. Yeah. And going to Kona, I was able to sleep on the airplane, which I never am able to. And this time I was able to do two, uh, two flights in a row of sleeping. Wow. I need so, to learn whatever trick you used. <laughs> now, that's a really easy trick. You go to a standards meeting and you pay a lot of attention. You go to all the discussions <laughs> with everybody and you'll just fall asleep automatically. <laughs> I can really recommend it. So, in other words, you will not be making it to Cologne, right? I will not be at Cologne, but I'm trying to be at the next four, five, or six after that point. Okay. So I've also uh, contacted my own national body to try to join them, and I'm oh. currently working on getting that arranged. So, so uh, just as a side note to anybody who is not a member of the national body and is interested, you can go and you can join even if you're not an official member. Okay. Unlike the rest of the ISO meetings, uh, the C++ meetings are intended to be uh, attended by everybody who's interested in language, so they are not putting in a, a hard barrier that says you may not join unless. You just have to let them know before you go. But there is, uh, like, your stand, your, it's, the votes are based on, like, national st standards bodies or something, right? So if you just show up and you're not a member, technically, then your vote is less relevant or something? That's partially true. Okay. Uh, if you're a member of a national body or your uh, company is a member of a national body in case of the U.S., then at the final vote on plenary on Saturday, you only get to vote if you are the representative of your company or if you are a member of the national body. Okay. But for all the other days, which is Monday through Friday, any person in the room gets one vote. Oh, okay. Oh. Which means that you can actively participate, you can help out, and you are expected to have also read all the proposals that you're voting on. Well, that would make sense. Well, yes, but you'd be surprised how many people are um, okay with voting even though they haven't read the proposal. <laughs> uh, no, I guess I wouldn't be surprised, unfortunately. Just thinking about international politics in general. <laughs> oh, yes. So there's one thing you can always do, which is to abstain. 
there's usually a five-way poll, and the sixth vote that you can do is just to abstain, not vote at all, which is what you do if you haven't been paying enough attention during discussion, which sometimes happens for actual reasons, and if you haven't read up on a proposal before. Right. So do go, because there's a whole lot of stuff to do. So where'd you find yourself spending most of your time at uh, the Kona meeting? Like, what groups did you go to? Um, I, I was planning to go to at least uh, the evolution working group for modules and coroutines, because that's why I'm there, which is right. all of Tuesday and all of Wednesday. Uh, on Monday, I was trying to attend uh, the new two groups. There's a SG17 and 18, which is Library Evolution Incubator and Evolution Incubator. Uh, okay. Those are basically new proposals that haven't yet gotten to the stage where they are ri- uh, ripe for evolution, or smaller papers that are, just need a little bit tweaking before they get there, so they are essentially a knock, uh, knock out of the park. So that was an interesting thing to be at. That's looking at the new proposals, and because they're an incubator now, they will not meet 20, so there's a lot of space in actually helping them out with in- improving designs. On the Thursday, I had, I had a cheat day, and I rented a car to drive around the island because... You're, at, you're only on Hawaii once every so often, and it's mm. it's so far away. Yeah. So I figured I should do that at some point. Uh, in case you're looking at the webcam, I am slightly slightly uh, sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's not just lighting. <laughs> <laughs> I did assume it was lighting, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and on Friday, I went to the study groups that I'm participating in, which is SG13 uh, for audio, SG15 for tooling, and SG16 for Unicode. So they did not meet concurrently then, I take it. Uh, they meet concurrently with everything else that's happening. So I wasn't right. at Evolution at that time, wasn't at Library Evolution. You have to make some choices where you want to be. Okay. And you are going to miss some things that you really want to attend. For example, Wednesday afternoon, I was busy in the coroutines room looking at the national body presentation by Bulgaria. And at the same time, somebody was in, I forget where exactly it was, but they were voting on executors, hmm. which is something needed for a networking TS related to coroutines. So I would love to be there as well, but... You, you can't be in two rooms at the same time. It doesn't work. Right. So you so, try to find other people who are like-minded there. And I found uh, Chris DiBella, who was like-minded mm. and would like to be in co teams but had to be at executors. And we just shared our thoughts and ideas about that. So you could try to be in as many rooms as you can be. Since you brought it up, um, executors did not get voted into C++20. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, executors is still too young of a proposal to go in. And I think it is going for a TS, but the TS okay. did not come up for a vote yet. Right. So that is one of the big things that's still going to happen. And just looking ahead at C++23 for a second, there will be Executors TS, there is Reflection TS, which did get a vote. There is Networking TS, which is also still not in. Right. And there are a few new proposals that are also going into the C++23 backlog, which was discussed in Evolution on Saturday afternoon. So just in case you're thinking it's, it's been Saturday and we got through plenary, we're done. That's not how it works. We just keep going. And there was a big proposal on uh, pattern matching. Mm. Yeah, I see that added to the list here for uh, C plus 23 or 26. Is that also going to be a new TS? I think it's going to have to be a new TS. At some point during the discussion of it, I was asking uh, David Sankel, who was presenting, whether this was all in one single paper, because there were so many new things and new ideas being explained that I was having a a hard time keeping up with it all. Mm. But looking at the things that it allows you to do, It is basically allowing you to make a new statement called inspect, which does all the things that people want a switch to do when they're new to the language. (laughs) So the time that you found out that switch couldn't actually figure out which class something is, or the time that it couldn't switch over a uh, part of an enum or part of a a member that you have in a range, or that you can't have complicated switch statements in there, like if it's between 1 and 25, or if it's uh, an even number. That kind of stuff is possible with a very well-defined, good-to-read syntax. Surprisingly. And there is any part of this, uh, I'm looking at these like guards in here, I'm trying to think. Is it, yes, okay. So you can actually do, it's, it can be a runtime check of some sort, say, do this statement if this thing is true. Yes. So as far as I understood, you can basically also do a string switch now by yeah. saying if at runtime the string is equal to one of these, then do this. So it's all the stuff that you would want to be possible with a switch, but that isn't possible because switches just don't do that. Right. And now you can do it, assuming that this is actually going to happen. I did a technique similar to this in ChaiScript that I've ended up slowly removing because I realized no one was using it and it made the language <laughs> too complex. The guard, specifically. I'll be curious to see how this comes out with this, with this implementation. Uh, yeah, the language syntax reminds a bit of Prolog and Haskell. 
Right. Which means that if your programming style or your go- your goal for doing programming is not something that fun- uh, fits well in a functional context, then you're probably not going to be using it. Well, and to be clear, I'm not talking about the inspect itself. I'm talking about the if condition portion of the inspect, the pattern uh, guard section 5.4. I was about to ask, what page are you on? Yeah. So for our listeners, you can have a pattern and then an if statement inside the pattern that says, you know, whatever, if it matches this pattern and this condition is true, then execute this branch of the inspect. That's the part that I'm personally curious about. I do expect it to be used in some cases, but not in most. Right. In many Mm -hmm. cases, you're trying to match uh, either a decomposition or a specific literal of some sort that you want to be equal to whatever you're inspecting. Right. So in most cases, I would expect this to not be there, but I can already see the first use case that this is going to be used at, which is Fizzbuzz. (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and actually, ChaiScript has a very, very clean and succinct FizzBuzz implementation that I wrote. <laughs> it's go. the only use case that I've seen of that. <laughs> so this might not be useful enough, but again, this is a paper that was first presented in Evolution uh, Saturday uh, afternoon. So right. it, it hasn't had too many uh, feedback, too many experience in implementing it, too many right. experience in using it. I'll be very interested to see where this goes, because the general concept of the inspect, I'm totally on board with. I'll be curious about the rest of it as well. Yes. And it looks like they already are planning for the future with an inspect const expr, so it can be a chi- compile time choice. Just the same st- uh, uh, syntax as if const expr, so awesome. totally on board with that. Yep. I'm not surprised that you're on board with more const expr. <laughs> hey, <laughs> why do something at runtime that can be done at compile time? I mostly agree with that. <laughs> Mostly, <laughs> I'm I'm looking more forward to the other papers that are about trying to remove use of the preprocessor. Right. As in, uh, I remember a quote from uh, Bjorn Struser, which is basically that the C preprocessor should not need to be used anymore. And I'm phrasing it nicely in this case. Uh, <laughs> as far as I can tell, we still need it because there are many things that you don't, you cannot do without. And one of mm-hmm. those that is currently on the list of being voted in is to the source location. Yes. Which is pretty much. You know, we have func and file and line as preprocessor macros. How about we make this a language construct so we don't need a preprocessor macro? Yeah. yeah. So that removes one of the big uses for uh, for a preprocessor, which is in logging. Where did this log statement come from? Well, we can do that without macros. And then we That's... have includes, which is modules. Now we don't need includes anymore. We have inclusion guards in Pragma once. Oh, we have modules. We don't need that anymore. So we have if def for platform support. And then we have a few corner cases where... The preprocessor is sort of useful, but not necessary. But beyond that, it shouldn't be needed. Right. Yeah. And the if that for platforms, I believe Izzy Muerte has a paper about how to replace that. So that instead of uh, basically doing an if const expert at global scope, which is not possible because if is a runtime statement. Yes. And it doesn't doesn't work like that. Uh, and an if const expert like constructed global scope would need the second part to parse and be at least getting to the stage where you have an AST so you can ju- then reject half of it. Right, and her paper, her paper basically says, I have some statement that checks one or the other, and both of those halves need to tokenize, but not beyond. Which means that if you're doing if it's Windows, then you can call Windows functions, and if it's not Windows, then don't call Windows functions. So the change, and as long as it, as long as it's parsable, I guess is yeah. As long as it's lexable, not even mm-hmm. parsable. Lexable, okay. Well, since we spent. Every uh, all our time talking about all the great news coming out of Kona. Maybe we should finish up by just quickly mentioning these other articles I put in the show notes, and then uh, we can let you plug anything you have coming up, uh, Peter. So uh, all the meetings, C++ 2018 talks are now on YouTube. Those are done, yeah. So you can definitely go check those out. I think it was like 40 some, 47 talks uh, are available on YouTube now, so that's great. And then... Um, the Core C++ speaker list is out, right, Jason? Yes, so Core C++ has announced, I think, all the talks and who's speaking. Uh, I don't think the full schedule is quite online yet. Um, some of them are people that we know, and some of them are people that we've never had on the show. So it would be interesting, exciting to meet new people and go to that one for sure. So definitely, if you're in Israel or anywhere nearby, check out Core C++. Yeah. Uh, one thing to note about the Core C++ is that some of the talks will be in Hebrew, mm-hmm. which means that it, it may be very interesting, but in some cases it's going to be hard to follow as an international attendee. Right. Not trying right. to keep you from going, because it's a really good uh, place to be at, and there's going to be so many interesting talks. 
Yeah, at the moment, since the schedule hasn't been fully released yet, I don't know. I only see one or two things that are actually that are listed as being in Hebrew at the moment. That's I'm a good point. I'm not exactly sure. The initial idea was oh, to have yeah. one Hebrew track and one Hebrew and English track, but I've already spotted nine out of nineteen speakers as being, as far as I know, not able to speak Hebrew. So they right. may have flipped that upside down. So uh, when I added this link to the show notes the other day, I clicked on a couple of the speakers, and uh, one of them I remember being listed as Hebrew earlier and is now listed as English. So I'm not quite sure what to make of that. Yeah, at the moment, the only thing that I see that says that it's Hebrew on the schedule is uh, one of the training workshop days before the conference. Okay. I would definitely love to attend because I see a talk about coroutines there, about the actual use of it. And that seems to be a very, very on-topic thing. Indeed. And I know, as perhaps everyone could see from our conversation, very little about coroutines. And that talk, yes, is going to be in English. So I can go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, since we were talking about conference news, uh, do you have anything coming up? Any conference talks? I have a conference talk coming up at ACCU, which is going to be about uh, demystifying your compiler, where uh, if you're an absolute beginner, you compile your first Hello World, magic happens, and a binary appears that does something. Right. How did magic happen, and what exactly makes it tick? So that's going Gnomes. to be a talk I'm doing with Simon Brand at ACCU. And I have proposals coming up together with Chris DeBella about how the entire standardization proposal and uh, mechanism works. So all the stuff about evolution and core and library incubators and study groups, we'll have a, a talk about all of that that we probably will be submitting to CppCon. And I will also be submitting a talk there together with Arvid about uh, how a linker works. Oh, wow. Okay. But of course, uh, those are still too far out to actually know whether we're going to be uh, voted in because we haven't even got to got to submit a proposal yet. <laughs> yeah, the call for submissions for CPVCon is not out yet. Yeah. So that will come later. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show again today, Peter. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, talk to you later. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Lefticus on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com. Website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.